I'm Phil Lipoff in New York. A rail strike averted with the deal down to the wire. President Biden has announced a tentative railway agreement has been reached. What it means for commuters and the supply chain. Russia stepping up strikes on critical infrastructure after Ukrainian forces took back several key cities from Russian control. What they found after Russian forces retreated. And we are learning new details about the funeral for Queen Elizabeth. Soldiers marched through the streets in full rehearsal overnight. Now people are lining up for miles to see the Queen as she lies in state as the palace reveals plans for the state funeral. But we begin with President Biden just praising that tentative deal struck earlier this morning to avert a potential rail workers strike, calling it a big win for America. And this is a win for tens of thousands of rail workers and for their dignity and the dignity of their work. It's a recognition of that. During these early, dark, uncertain days of the pandemic, they showed up so every American could keep going. They worked tirelessly through the pandemic to ensure that families and communities got the deliveries they needed during these difficult few years. ABC News transportation producer Sam Sweeney joins me now uh, again just after that speech. Sam, before we get into the details, your thoughts. The speech was quick. It was to the point. Uh, sort of a political victory. A sigh of relief again for the Democrats. They were worried about this. They've been working several weeks on it. And last night, they worked late into the night, into the early morning, 20 consecutive hours to get the deal done. And the president's certainly happy about this two months before the midterms. And Sam, what were workers fighting for here? They wanted a pay raise, and they got that 24%. They're also going to get $1,000 a year bonuses. But the, one of the most important parts that they were hung up on was unpaid sick time. They wanted to be able to go to the doctors, take their kids to the doctors without being penalized. They were often working on a point system, and if they got too many points, they faced termination. And you have to remember, these train conductors and engineers are often assigned to a trip last minute. They last several days, and it can take them all across the country. So it is tough for the railroad company. Uh, to come up with schedules, but also really take care of their employees. But they seem to have found a deal. This strike would have been the first in decades, as you say, crisis averted for so many Americans. Uh, how would this strike, though, have impacted the economy? What was at stake here? $2 billion a day, our shelves in the grocery stores would have been empty. It would have been hard for farmers to get their feed, to also get their wheat back out. It would have been a, a, a difficult for the ports to get their product in and out of ports. And of course, it would have put more pressure on the trucking uh, across the country, which were already in short, uh, short supply of truck drivers. They would have needed an additional 460,000 trucks a day to move the equivalent amount of freight that these trains move, roughly 30% of all freight in the United States. All right, crisis averted indeed, at least tentatively. <laughs> Sam Sweeney, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, to Ukraine now. President Zelensky visited a city liberated just days ago by his forces and promised more victories are to come. However, the Russians are still targeting Ukrainian cities and vital infrastructure. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge is on the ground for us in Ukraine. Tom. Yeah, Phil, we heard a strike overnight, uh, just a few kilometers probably from our hotel uh, here in Kharkiv. It's a pretty regular occurrence. And just look at the damage. That's a residential building in downtown Kharkiv, the second biggest city of Ukraine. And there's destruction like that dotted all around the city center. Away from here in Krivy Rig, a small city uh, down in the south central Ukraine. Uh, that was hit by Russian missiles overnight. Russia hitting a dam, flooding the area. Uh, that is the hometown of President Zelensky. Zelensky saying it is one of the reasons uh, why Russia will lose this war and also lose in history because of its targeting of civilian structures and targets uh, consistently throughout this six-month war. Now, the offensive in the south grinds on. That's a slow offensive. Ukrainian forces saying they've taken a small amount of territory in the last 24 hours. The offensive, the lightning offensive up here in the northeast, has now finished, according to Western officials. Western officials saying Ukrainian forces are now working to consolidate their gains here. And now Ukraine has recaptured this entire territory. This morning, we've seen the first train come into Kharkiv central station for the first time from those newly liberated territories. It's remarkable that just in a matter of days after liberating that land, Ukraine is making sure it's reconnected to the rest of the country. Phil? Tom Sufi Burridge on the ground in Ukraine for us. Thank you. And coming up, we are live from London with the huge lines, miles long, people paying respects to Queen Elizabeth II. Diane Macedo is there. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. You might hear some construction work behind me as final preparations are underway here in London for Monday's funeral for Queen Elizabeth. Thousands of military personnel took part in a full rehearsal early this morning, marching through the streets, towing the state gun carriage that will carry the Queen's coffin as the bagpipes played. It's a preview of what's to come on Monday's big procession into and out of Westminster Abbey behind me where the state funeral will take place. And ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman is here with me now with a little bit more on this. And James, the palace just re released some new details uh, about the funeral. What's the latest? So this, uh, the long lines of people waiting to see her uh, lying in state, that will end at 6 a.m. on Monday morning, and then everything gets uh, gets going, gets kicked into gear. So she will be brought in procession from Westminster Palace, which is just behind us here, very short distance into Westminster Abbey. The funeral will last an hour. The Archbishop of Canterbury is going to be leading that. And then once it's done, uh, she'll be brought back out here, and there'll be a full ceremonial procession through London. The crown jewels will be on her coffin. She is our head of state, and that's why they'll be there. These priceless jewels will be there for everyone to see. The royal standard, of course, draped over the coffin, as we've already seen. It'll be pulled uh, by uh, six black horses, uh, and the household cavalry will be accompanying her, of course, uh, through London. And then she'll be taken by car to Windsor, where there'll be a private service at um, the chapel there, St George's Chapel, which we've seen many times at all kinds of different royal occasions. She'll be buried alongside her husband, her father, and her sister, Princess Margaret. Now, we saw some of the rehearsals overnight for this. This happened in the middle of the night, and again, it was just a rehearsal, and yet people still came out to watch. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, remember, people have come from not just all over the country, but all over the world to be here, so I think maybe they're getting their money's worth. They want to see all the different stuff that's going on. Um, I actually was walking over here earlier today, and I saw a group of Canadian tourists who were already camping in the park to get a good spot for the actual funeral on Monday. I mean, we're thinking maybe a million people in the city. It's going to be extraordinary. Security is going to be tight for that, for sure. Uh, and while the crowd is expected to be, as you said, upwards of a million people for the funeral, you're already talking about hundreds of thousands of people that are lining up as we speak to see the Queen as she lies in state in Westminster Palace. I know you were out on the line earlier this morning. What was that like? It's very moving, really, just seeing your compatriots, you know, lining up to see the head of state. Uh, this has happened a number of times before. We've seen these extraordinary pictures pictures actually of, of earlier lines queuing up to see George VI and the Queen Mother only 10, uh, 20 years ago, but this outstrips any of that. The numbers are much, much larger. People are upbeat. It's kind of a happy atmosphere. And then when you get closer to Westminster Hall, it becomes a lot more somber. People are really there in mourning. I mean, but just think about it, 10 hours in line for two seconds next to the Queen's coffin. Mm. But for up tens of thousands of people, that's worth it. And the King is said to be taking a personal day of reflection today, so we don't expect to see him today. But we are now hearing that we will see him and his siblings tomorrow night. That's right. So today he is uh, with his red boxes. He's head of state, so he's going to go through uh, sort of official papers, I imagine, being briefed about the security preparations for the actual funeral um, and also speaking to the governor generals of all the different countries where he is also head of state. But yes, tomorrow we will see him and his siblings, very moving moment, I think, with Princess Anne, Prince Edward and Prince Andrew. They will stand vigil for 15 minutes uh, out, out on the four corners of their mother's coffin. Uh, and I think that's going to be another very moving moment in a whole series of extremely moving moments. And walk us through the symbolism there, James, because so much of all of the ceremonies that we've seen so far seem to be about the dual role. Uh, she played many more, but but the role that the Queen played as head of the family and also head of state. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and seeing her children around her is just going to be a very moving moment. And and for the people to be close to these, these members of the royal family, I think that's what a lot of people in the United States find strange about this. It's very close. You know, we are just hands breadth from, from them as they're close to us. The security preparations are going to be insane because the royal family wants to be seen to be close to us. While they're grieving, they know the nation is grieving mm -hmm. and they're trying to show us that we can all do it together. All right, James Longman, great to have you as always. Thank you. And coming up, we have some of the today's top stories and a special look at the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. President Biden is giving remarks about the tentative uh, deal reached early this morning after a potential rail strike was in the works. Let's listen to him from the Rose Garden. I want to Garden. thank the lead negotiators and the, from the labor movement, 
the brother of locomotive engineers, the trainmen, International Association of Sheet Metal and Air and Rail and Transportation Workers Union, and the other labor unions engaged. And this is a win for tens of thousands of rail workers and for their dignity and the dignity of their work. It's a recognition of that. During these early, dark, uncertain days of the pandemic, they showed up so every American could keep going. They worked tirelessly through the pandemic to ensure that families and communities got the deliveries they needed during these difficult few years. And because of the labor agreement, those rail workers will get better pay, a 24 percent wage increase over the next five years, improved working conditions, peace of mind around their health care by capping the cost that workers will have to pay. And it's about the right to go to a doctor or stay healthy and make sure you're able to have the care you can afford. It's all part of this agreement. They earned and deserve these benefits. And this is a great deal for both sides, in my view. The agreement is also a victory for railway companies. And I want to thank the lead negotiators from the railway, the National Railway Labor Conference and our major rail companies. These companies also played a, uh, a critical role in keeping America moving during the pandemic. And that's not hyperbole, it's a fact. With this agreement, railroad companies will be able to retain and recruit workers. They'll be able to continue to operate effectively as a vital piece of our economy. They're really the backbone of the economy. I have this visual image of rails being the backbone. I mean, literally, the backbone of the economy. So I thank the unions and the rail companies for negotiating in good faith. They've been up for 20 straight hours to that negotiation and, uh, and for sticking with it, especially over the last few days. In fact, the negotiators here today, I don't think they've been to bed yet. So <laughs> I don't want to keep this very long and they're having to stand as besides. Together, we reached an agreement. You reached an agreement that will keep our critical rail system working and avoid disruptions of our economy. And I'm grateful, grateful for the members of the administration who work tirelessly on both sides to help get this done. I especially want to thank Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, a card-carrying union member and the first union labor secretary in decades, for his tireless round-the-clock work. <laughs> this agreement is validation, validation of what I've always believed. Unions and management can work together, can work together for the benefit of everyone. They're traveling now. Uh, uh, a number of them, up, but I want to thank Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg and Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, who are deeply involved, along with, uh, I want to thank Deputy Labor Secretary Julie Su, Director of the National Economic Council Brian Deese, and uh, the uh, Deputy National Director of Labor Celeste Drake for this uh, commitment and hard work. To the American people, this agreement can avert a significant damage that any shutdown would have brought. Our nation's rail system is the backbone of our supply chain. Everything you rely on, and it's hard to realize this, from everything from clean water to food to gas to everyday, I mean, liquefied natural gas, to everything, every good that you need seems to end up on a rail getting delivered to where it needs to go. With unemployment still no record lows and signs of progress and lowering costs, this agreement allows us to continue to rebuild a better America with an economy that truly works for working people and their families. Today is a win, and I mean it sincerely, a win for America. So I want to thank you all for getting this done, both business and labor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you so much. Mr. President, Mr. President, President is it premature to celebrate before the union's vote? DC, Mr. President, grocery prices are up over 13%. What do you tell struggling Americans? The rail's moving is not going to go up. The migrants, are you confident the situation at the border is under control, Mr. President? Mr. President, is unpaid sick leave good for workers? What was the question that popped? Questions being asked to the president there from reporters in the Rose Garden, not uh, answering any of them, uh, but a rail strike averted. Well, he answered one. With the deal down to the wire, President Biden, uh, just speaking from the Rose Garden, let's bring in Sam Sweeney, uh, transportation producer, to break this down. It, it was pretty brief, Sam, a lot of platitudes, especially for uh, 
uh, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. But uh, what do you think of what the president had to say? Phil, the president, this entire administration, breathing a big sigh of relief. You know, we're two months out from the midterms. This would have been catastrophic uh, for this entire country, for the economy. Two billion dollars a day. The president calling it a big win for America and a victory for the railways. Of course, this is a president who is union strong. He was known as Amtrak Joe. He is a train person. Uh, he couldn't afford this. Democrats couldn't have afforded this. Uh, any sort of strike that would have had a catastrophic. Uh, catastrophic consequences for the entire economy, from farmers to consumers to travelers all across this country. Yeah, it would have had a, a massive impact. Sam Sweeney, thanks for that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.